thank you to First Lady for a terrific set of remarks and uh, to all of the officials. So, imagine healthy, happy adolescents worldwide. In just this last week that we are gathering here in Zambia, 4,000 young women aged 15 to 24 learned that they would face a lifetime of dealing every day with a virus that brings with it stigma, prejudice, and potential illness and premature death. These young people, and three quarters of them live in this region, will have to take medication every day for the rest of their lives and always think about the risk of transmission to partners and to their unborn and newborn babies. These preventable deaths mean that health opportunities were missed. Opportunities missed by ourselves in the health sector. In the current world, most of all though, it is a young and dynamic world. There are 1.2 billion youth aged 15 to 24 in the world today. Most of them live and move on our continent all have hopes and dreams and share a future. Adolescence is, as we know here, an age of transition and great change, physically, socially, and psychologically. With sexual maturity, hormones are unleashed and brain modeling continues. First, the back part of the brain develops, enabling impulsiveness and experimentation, critical to learning how to leave the childhood nest and move uh, considered reasonable and, uh, and the more considered reasonable executive functions of the forebrain only kick in towards the end of the adolescent period, allowing the final transition through adolescence to adulthood. This allows separation from caregiving adults increasing autonomy, discovery of sexuality and gender identity, increasing experimentation, testing boundaries and limits, experimenting possibly with substances, courting risks and displaying apparent scant regard for longer term consequences. This of course has been happening for decades, if not centuries, and is the natural physiological and psychological development that is required to move a child to an adult and ultimately to a parent in the perpetuation of our species Homo sapiens. It is exactly the same principle required to get the bird from the nest, get the lion cub into the pride and the blue whale to leave its mother's side. There are without doubt many aspects of modern day living which can make this time risky and fraught with dangers. First Lady, I am also a mother and I understand that for adults and parents we are correctly anxious about this. But does this mean we mothball our adolescents for 12 years? Can we forbid natural experimentation, treat them like children in the hopes that they won't grow? We cannot withhold critical information, tools and innovation in the hope that this important period with its risks and difficulties would simply disappear. On the contrary, we must see this period as a time of opportunity and skills building. We must cash in on their evolving capacities. Thus, we can entertain the concept of harm reduction, safely enabling and safeguarding the transition without stifling it, allowing our adolescents to flourish. Our task is to promote health services that work for adolescents. We can use innovation and mod modern technology to do so. Youth have been telling us for decades and continue to do so exactly what they need from us. It is ourselves that are not hearing. Simply put, young people want to self-care. They want to thrive and flourish and they want to live their best 
and healthiest lives. But they come up against health systems that are fragmented, prejudicial, difficult to navigate, unaffordable, lengthy, and complex. This is a sad excuse for a health solution that is totally lost on a brain, a lifestyle, and a psyche that craves a viewpoint about the here and now, speediness, tolerance, friendliness, transparency, privacy, respectfulness, low cost, that provides tailored information on treatments, prevention, and care that preferably can be carried on a phone or even in a pocket. It should speak to peers and groupthink. It should, of course, be fun and direct. So then, what are the challenges that we are responding to today? And there's no doubt that they fall into the group of education, keeping girls in school, the incredible burden of communicable diseases, particularly HIV and STIs, the futures that are needed um, by our, our young people, their, their vulnerable employment, and of course, contraceptive needs. So, oh dear. Oh, Diego, you're messing up my timing, which was spectacular here. So. <laughs> I'm on a roll. So what, how do we respond to this? Well, we need to come in with uh, HIV care and treatment, prevention, very important, sexual health, reproductive health, maternal uh, uh, mental health care, and of course, future planning. Instead, what uh, we find is that uh, we have uh, an approach that has been siloed, conservative, fragmented, under-resourced, and unimaginative. And it is no wonder we have left the adolescents of the world underwhelmed and frustrated. So how do we build a service that adolescents can use? Well, we need to start with understanding our adolescents, the adolescents that are in your uh, corner. What are their specific tailored needs? Pack your suitcase accordingly. Figure out where best to find them. They are generally not in our healthcare facilities, certainly not spending all their time there. Get imaginative about the platform. Think outside of the box. Get creative. Then build the system. Start with positive, gain-framed demand creation. Create awareness. Think about the entry points using services or locations. People will then start to move towards screening and diagnosis. Adopt a seroneutral service generic approach. Offer the package and engagement and persistence will follow with sexual, reproductive, and mental health impact following even then as a result. Never miss an opportunity to provide these services in an integrated fashion. You may well save a life. One example we have had the privilege of carrying out uh, is the Fast Prep program. This is a uh, implementation science program project to evaluate the uptake, coverage, and effectiveness of a youth-focused, decentralized, district-wide PrEP program. And what we're doing is attaching to that contraception, STI screening, HIV testing, antiretroviral provision for those who are uh, who find themselves seropositive, and mental health support. This is all done through peer navigation in mobile clinics, local clinics, schools, uh, hairdressing salons, taverns, youth clubs, and even couriered services. We're rolling out to 25,000 people over three years. We've reached 13,000. 50% of them have taken up PrEP, and two-thirds of them continue to come for prevention. 
We are also now experimenting with adding non-communicable diseases to our suitcase, recognizing that this may appeal to young men who are, as we heard this morning, missing in action, and recognizing that we have a new epidemic of diabetes, obesity, and hypertension coming on. So the Impilo Health Park now covers not only HIV, sexual reproductive health, but also includes non-communicable disease prevention, paying attention to smoking and alcohol abuse as well, and saying how can we get our young people to be fit whilst they are sexually well and mentally well at the same time. And this program is just getting underway to see if indeed this suitcase it is going to do the trick. Thank you to the many, many people who have taught me that we can imagine a world of happy, healthy, thriving adolescents and young adults. Especially thank you to the young people themselves and their families. Thank you also to the sources of data that went into this talk, the artists I've used, and the funders. And thank you to the team at home who helped me to put this together. Most of all, thank you to all of you for listening. <laughs>